Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Robert Frank, the Henrietta Johnson Lewis Professor of Management at the Johnson School at Cornell University. His latest book is The Economic Naturalist, In Search of Explanations for Everyday Enigmas. Bob, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me on, Russ. Now, your book, The Economic Naturalist, is a series of puzzles with explanations drawn from the economic way of thinking. It's about the economic way of thinking applied to everyday life. But the book has an unusual origin. It's based on your teaching and your ideas about economic education. And you're not a big fan of the standard undergraduate economics class. Tell us why not and how that affected the book and how you teach your class. Well, you know uh, how we teach the introductory course normally. There's a big encyclopedic text with every idea that's ever been written about crammed into it. And then professors try to work through as many of them as they can in a semester's time. Uh, A lot of it's couched in the form of equations and graphs. And students don't much like it. They, They take these courses because I think they're seen as a stepping stone to careers that pay well. But What we've discovered now is that uh, if you give introductory students, ones who've taken this traditional course, a test that probes their knowledge of basic economics six months after they're done, they don't score any better than people who never took the course at all. It's a a real scandal. I mean, if you think about performance at that level in an industry that spends hundreds of millions of dollars on, on its service, you know, there would have been malpractice suits filed long since. It's, for some reason, something we get away with year after year. We put them through all these hoops, but they don't seem to learn anything. So it was, it was that performance or lack of it that really set me looking for a better way to do this. Well, I have to ask you, do you is it just economics classes that fail their customers? You know, I've been talking about this issue to other groups. The engineers here at Cornell invited me to speak to them. I've spoken to the physicists. Uh, All the groups I've spoken to so far say afterwards, yeah, this is a problem for them too. Yeah, they're they're trying to show that they're cutting edge and up to the moment, and so they throw a lot of stuff at students. They say, how much can I cover today? They, They ought to be asking, how much can my students absorb today, really? But, uh, yeah, I think it is a widespread problem. It's not just economics. So talk about the book and your approach as a response to that challenge. Yeah, the the book grew out of an assignment I've been giving, oh, for probably 20 years in my all my economics classes. There's a, a program here at Cornell called the, the Night Writing Program in the Majors, and uh, it's really trying to spread writing assignments out into the upper division courses in the disciplines. Uh, the theory is that if you if you want to learn about an idea, there's really n- almost no better way to, to get your brain around the idea than to write about it. So this program funded a TA for me. This is back in the early 80s uh, when, when I f- first got involved in it. And the TAs graded the papers and were trained to give feedback. So that, that was the key step. You know, professors wouldn't assign papers unless they had somebody to grade them. And and so that's what the program basically paid for. And so I started assigning papers, and I really noticed a difference in the level of engagement that my students brought to the the subject matter. They seemed to be really much more wrapped up in it. When I lost the TA support, this was after a couple of years I'd been doing it, uh, I cut back on the length of the papers. Uh, I started out maybe 20 pages each since I wasn't grading them, but uh, as I started having to do them myself, I didn't want to abandon the exercise entirely because it seemed to be working so well. But uh, I cut back to 10, then 5, and then uh, finally in the current incarnation, I say 500 words maximum. And the interesting... Which is way too many in some cases, I'm Which sure. is probably <laughs> way too many. I tell them that the best ones that are turned in are often a third that long yeah. or even shorter. They have to pose an interesting question, and they have to then use some basic economic principles to try and answer it. And the shorter they got, the better they were. Uh, and as you say, maybe uh, I should set the limit of 200 words. Uh, that might not be such a bad idea. Maybe I'll try that the next time. 
but what what I found in doing that was that uh, you know it was a challenge for students. You know, if you think about having to come up with an interesting question, well, that's that's not so easy, uh, and they have to do it twice during the term. So the first time they would they would come by and seem worried and ask whether their question was interesting enough, and often, sure enough, it wasn't. Uh, but then on the second round, at the end of the term, they had the second one due, and far more typical was for them to come by and ask whether they could do a medley. They wanted to do three of them. They had, they had three good questions. Could they, if they kept them short enough, do all three? And, uh, you know, that, that to me is just a clear signal that during the course of this exercise, their brains got rewired. You know, suddenly they're seeing economic principles helping them organize observations that they make out there in the world. Yeah, that's no, a very cool thing. So, so how does the book play on that? Well, the the book is is really a collection of greatest hits. You know, I, I've been searching out examples like this ever since I've been doing economics, and so I've always presented a bunch of them to students to give them the idea of what I'm shooting for when I ask them to do this. And then, you know, I probably have read oh several thousand of these, five six thousand of these at last count. Uh, you know, Cornell students are good students. Uh, they work hard on these, and uh, there are about 150 of them in the book. I'd say 100 of them are directly inspired by student papers, and, you know, that's that's the best of a really good set of essays from smart students. So I, I think, you know, I, I personally could never have written such an interesting collection of examples, I think, single-handedly. I, don't, I, I wonder that anyone could, but uh, really it's it's a nice collection for people to to take and browse. You don't need to read them in sequence, although they are organized by topic. Uh, and you can, I think, in a, in, a, in a single reading of this book, walk away with more permanent knowledge of basic economic ideas than most students carry out of a principal's course. Which raises an interesting question. I, I, I think I agree with you, by the way, uh, about that, the, the amount of knowledge it's learned. And, and I argue that in today's world, with so much information available via the blogosphere and via what I hope is the case with podcasts like this one, that people can learn the art of the economic way of thinking. It's not so scientific. We wish right. it were, but it's a, it's a real art. And before this, in a different age, the way you absorbed it, as you point out, was not in the classroom because typically in the classroom, you just got a lot of formalism, a lot of graphs and equations. The way you'd absorb it would be by hanging out with economists at lunch. Mm -hmm. That's the way a lot of us Absolutely. learned it as grad students when we would argue over puzzles and problems or, right. as, or as faculty as we were uh, as, as academics. Oh, that's exactly it. Yeah, it's, it's narrative that the brain's well adapted for. You know, we, we exchanged information all through evolutionary development, and, you know, the impulse wasn't to grab a twig and start sketching equations and graphs in the sand. You know, we told stories, and, and the brain's just marvelously adapted to become interested in and absorb and process information that's, that's packaged in the form of a narrative. And we, we had an interesting podcast with Daniel Pink on this, related to this, where we talked about how much storytelling is such a great skill and underrated in the, in the, in the business world. Right, And yet right. successful executives, advertisers, marketers, are, they're storytellers to, exactly. to a large extent. It's an interesting question about why that is. Uh, you know, it's, we may have sat around the campfire in primitive times telling stories, but the hard wiring of the brain, it's not, it's interesting that that may have been evolutionarily valuable. It's not obvious why that would be. Have you thought about that at all? You know, uh, we, we teach our students that information is valuable, that, that you should spend real economic resources becoming better informed up to a point. Uh, and so I think people who, who could acquire information from others through, through, fluid exchange had to have had at least some advantages in virtually any environmental context I can think of. And, uh, you know, social alliances are also important. So if, if you're boring and if you don't have anything at all interesting to say, then uh, people won't want to spend time with you. You won't be yeah. able to forge bonds with them. You won't be able to solve the whole potpourri of cooperation problems that we confront as a species. I, I, I noticed when I was living in France for a year. I, my colleagues were incredibly generous about speaking in French to me. It was my goal to, to master it in the year I spent there. I'd never taken any in college. But, you know, I, I was in the first part of the year the, the dumbest guy by far in every conversation. I didn't have much interesting to say. 
And so, you know, you just don't get any airtime if you don't have anything yep. interesting to say. So I finally started translating jokes, shaggy dog stories into French. And uh, it turned, I mean, maybe it's their their preference to, to listen to people like Jerry Lewis that accounts for this, but they seemed honestly to really enjoy listening to these stupid jokes I would tell, but that got me airtime. I guess the interesting question would be whether uh, you, you knew some they didn't know. Were they actual <laughs> or were they just laughing at your French? But I, I assume yeah, it's you no, probably. Who knows, but, you but, were innovating, I'm sure. But they, they, they encouraged me, and so nice. I got airtime. Uh, but we go back to the question we, we, we just uh, left unanswered on the table. If I agree with you that this the storytelling uh, and chatting and reading puzzles and thinking about puzzles are a very powerful way to learn economics compared to the, the standard um, overview textbook that covers everything shallowly. Uh, how does that, what does that imply for how you teach the actual class? You just, well, for example, you could just say on the first day of class, here's a really good book. I wrote it. Go <laughs> read it and come back in three and a half months with your own three examples like this and I'll grade you accordingly. Some you know, would think, argue that would be a better educational experience than sitting through the, the lectures. It would be, I think it would be more effective than what we do. Uh, but if you've got their time for three and a half months, I think you can do better than that. Uh, we, and, and what would you do in those three and a half months? Well, I think you got to, uh, what's really useful, I think, before you go into a course like that, really any course probably, is, is to sit down and, and imagine that you had two hours to explain the highlights of what you wanted them to try and master of, of whatever subject it might be. And so I think that as, a, as, a, as an exercise forces you to strip away everything that you don't really think is essential. So I, I managed to get the list of basic economic principles down to seven by doing that. And you could argue, should there be three or four or five or 12? You know, but the main point is there's some short list that covers uh, a, an alarmingly high proportion of everything that I think we actually are able to explain using economics. So you got you got a, a clear vision of a short list of things you want them to master, and then figure out how to wrap each of those principles up in as many different examples as you can. You know, it's repetition that's that's really the key. It's drill. It's it's uh, active using of the material. You know, the the brain doesn't learn something that it hears only once. I mean, if you think about the brain as a as a organ with scarce storage capacity. Why should it carve out new scarce circuitry for something that's going to happen once and never again? You know, it's it's only through repeated exposure that the brain begins to rewire itself to to take account of the new information, yes, unless I'm, it's paired with something that just scares you or fascinates you or makes you laugh. Yeah, yeah. So there are, there are certain pairings of stimuli that uh, or vivid images, you know, that will make you remember something on one trial, but but uh, with with much of what we learn, it's it's stuff we learn because we've done it repeatedly, and so it's just efficient for the brain to carve out a, a pathway for that thing. And I think if you don't do that, then it's it's very difficult to to summon a principle and apply it to something you observe when you're walking around in the world, because you'll you'll have sort of passed the moment where that principle applies before it would ever occur to you that that might be implicated in the pattern you just saw. I think that's extremely important. Uh, yeah, it, and and it, teachers it, teachers underestimate the value of it. They they get mad when their students forget stuff that they told them. Right. And they right. say, "Well, I, I told you that." Yes. And and I'm thinking, but we didn't hear it. We you said it. It came out of your mouth. We were in the room. Uh, but yeah. So for me, I, you know, my strategy is you take that two hours of the essential stuff, and you just give that eight or ten times over the course of the semester, and you hope they learn that two hours because that's really we that's don't know, we don't have that much more to tell. It's true. We can jazz it up with marginal productivity theory, but um, that doesn't really help that much. We, I interviewed Vernon Smith a few months back, my colleague here at George Mason, and just to repeat a story that some listeners may not have heard and you may not know, uh, somebody in, in Smith's class as a graduate student at Harvard asked Leontief what, what utility theory was good for, the theory of the consumer, mm -hmm. and Leontief's answer was teaching. <laughs> that's what it's good for. It fills up the time, uh -huh. you know? And I, I feel like write exam questions yeah, make, based on it. Well, that's my version. I always say it's good for exam questions. But if, when I realized that that's all it was good for, most of it, and there's a few things that are worth right. teaching students about cons the theory of the consumer, but most of it's only good for exam questions. Don't spend much time on that. 
Um, well, let's move on to some examples from the book, uh, which are, which is the more interesting part than than probably to some of our listeners than you and I philosophizing about education. Right. Although I will come back to that at the end. Um, so the examples try to illuminate these basic principles. Uh, some of them are, you talk about opportunity costs, the role of costs and benefits, supply and demand, the tragedy of the commons. So I'm going to take a few examples from each from some of these areas and uh, let you talk about them. I may uh, chime in now and then with a footnote or two, but I, they're so interesting. Um, you, you ask, why are vending machines for soda so different from vending machines for newspapers? So when you buy a soda, you put your money in and you get one soda pops out at the bottom and you take it and you go on. But with newspapers, uh, you open the door and if you want, you can take four or five. You might get you might get caught, but a lot of the times you could take four or five, three or even at least two, and probably nothing would happen to you. So they seem to be more trusting. I asked this question of a friend of mine. I love doing this because uh -huh. I find out what the value of economics is. And my friend said, well, People who read newspapers are more educated, mm -hmm. so educated people are more honest. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with the first, not so sure I agree with the second. But so the theory was is that since newspaper readers are more honest, they're less likely to steal the newspapers, and that's why they make the machines like that. They're cheaper, and they don't have to worry about theft. Right. But that's not the right answer, I don't think. Well, that, that's not the answer that my student, Brendan Quigley, suggested uh, in response to that question. That's one he posed in one of his essays. Uh, there's a there's a chapter in the book called uh, well I forget what it's called the economics of product design yeah, or I remember. something to that effect <laughs> but it's all about uh, various specific product design features and why they take the forms they do and and so he argued that uh, you know you could make a, a newspaper vending machine dispense only one paper at a time you know the cash machines uh, do essentially that trick so it's 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 certainly a doable engineering problem. But uh, his explanation was that it'd be a lot more expensive to build a machine like that than one whose door just opens and then locks shut when you shut it. Uh, and since most people wouldn't stand to benefit by having a second newspaper if they already had one, uh, it's not very common for anyone to have a motive to steal a newspaper. Having read one, uh, you're essentially you're, you're home. You don't need any more newspaper. So uh, the the cost of making the more elaborate machine just wasn't justified since the threat of theft was fairly minimal in which the I newspaper think, case. Which is obviously true. Uh, the the only quibble I had with it was you you can sell the second newspaper, and I've I've seen it done. Uh, I've seen people out on the street selling newspapers that I suspect they've just uh, foraged uh, from a machine. It's an unusual bit of entrepreneurship. That that's that's an interesting. Uh, Possibility, but, obviously. But it's harder to sell that second newspaper than it is to drink the second soda, which you can <laughs> take home. So I still, as, as you point out in the book, there are a lot of these examples where you can quibble or debate the, the actual answer, but the there's some the economics has something deep to do with what's going on there. The other thing that's cool about the newspaper example is that the soda machine uh, owner is really upset when you take the second soda because uh, that's a soda that, that, that can't be sold. But the owner of the newspaper isn't quite as upset when you steal the newspaper and resell it or give it away or just put it somewhere because they make a large portion of their revenue from advertising, not from the sales right. of the and, and that paper. boosts circulation, which, right. which helps them sell advertising. So there's yeah, that's a good point. Like no, that, that, that was not in the suggested explanation, which – you know, it would almost be a better book if if it had been necessary. If the if the examples had all been perfect, it would have been an improvement to go through and and make the answers incomplete or erroneous in at least a handful of cases, which which I'm sure is the case in the book as it stands. Just because it gets people arguing and offering suggestions and, and engaged in the conversation. Well, uh, I, yeah, there's two books you could have written. One would just be the questions. Uh, with no answers, <laughs> really not yeah. quite what you had in mind. Uh, the other would be to just maybe after f a few years, if if uh, if uh, Basic Books was tolerant of it, they probably won't be, but would be to put each of them up on the web uh, one by one and let people comment on them uh, in blog format right. and right. argue about it because right. it's fun. You learn something. Yeah. You learn something you hadn't. Exactly. And what I like, one of the things I liked about the book is inevitably there's some sort of institutional detail or fact about 
about the world that you didn't know that right. turns out to be important. Right. Um, let's move on to another one. Why do female models earn more than male models? A question I'd never thought about. It's a great question. Um, again, a bad answer would be it's because women are more beautiful than men. That's the first thing out of the, the guy's mouths yep. when you ask the question. They say, well, the women are just better looking, which is so unfair, of course, yeah. since it's each sex wrong. has its own <laughs> standard of beauty. But yeah. uh, but but it's it's uh, it's a striking difference. I don't know if if uh, if you've looked at the numbers, but uh, Giselle Bündchen is the highest paid female model, and last year she earned thirty million bucks modeling. Uh, I couldn't find a single male model whose salary went into seven figures last year. You know, it's a huge difference. Fran Adams asked that question about ten years ago in my class, and. Her suggestion was that women in the U.S. and in other countries, the, the difference is even bigger, spend at least twice as much as men on clothing, and they also give a lot of thought to what clothing they buy. So if you look at the the fashion magazines, Elle and Vogue, they're an inch and a half thick. They've got th literally thousands of pictures. Uh, lots of women read them. They th thumb through quickly. If you've got a model that captures the look of the moment, you can get somebody to stop on your page, and that's worth a lot of money to you. Uh, I don't have any friends that I can name who regularly read a men's fashion magazine. I suspect most of my friends couldn't even name one. I can't think of one. I yeah. guess GQ would GQ, be the only yeah, one. Be, it's sort is, of, is sort of one. still a fashion yeah, it, magazine? Not, not exactly. It's not yeah, the same so, as Ellen Vogue. So, but, but, but mainly guys don't think that much about what clothing they're they're searching for, and they just, you know, replace suits that have rips in them. So it, if you have a, a model that captures the look of the moment for a guy, you're not going to sell that many clothes. Of course, it, you'd think it would be easier to sell fashion. No, I guess that wouldn't work out. Let's, let's, let's move on. But it's a, it's, again, it, what I like about that is the questions as interesting as the answer. Right. It's a phenomenon out in the world you might not have thought about. Let me give another question from the book that I liked uh, a great deal. And I also want to preface it by saying that one way to enjoy this book is to uh, read it to your kids. And I, I'm sure you'd like to open up the sales of the book to people with children. <laughs> it's a small market, people with children. Uh, but what I did uh, for fun getting ready for this podcast is I asked my kids some of the questions in the uh -huh. book to see their answers. And I think it's really, since you can't guarantee your kids are going to major in economics, and even if they do, they might end up at a place not like Cornell or George Mason. They might end up at a place where all they get is the graphs and the right. equations. They won't learn anything. Right. Well, don't you want your kids to grow up and be well-rounded and understand the economic way of thinking? So what you do is over the dinner table or in the car, you ask these questions and you let your kids try to answer them. And they're not so good at first, but eventually they get the hang of it. So mm -hmm. one, one I really liked for them, uh, which, which I'll uh, throw out now, is the, is the question of why in New York, if you, New York in say in Manhattan, if you stop someone on the street and ask them directions – uh, you get a different response than in, say, Topeka, Kansas. Now, yeah, the standard answer that would be wrong there would be, well, people in New York are rude. It's just a cultural thing. Uh, New Yorkers are rude and people in Kansas are nice. And that's, I think, what most people believe. And they might be tr it might be true, mm -hmm. but, but the economics is deeper. Go ahead. Tell us about it. Well, it, it might be true, but it wouldn't explain why they're rude. You know, I think that's always the... The dissatisfying exactly. thing about cultural explanations is that it, it, you, you don't really come to grips with why the cultures are different. And often they're different because of different opportunities or or income levels that, that people face. So, so yeah, in the, in the case of the the New York example, well, some people quarrel with it. And, you know, if you go into the neighborhoods in New York, people do have nice, uh, helpful networks of association that they, they rely on. So pe people are people, I think. But I do know this, that whenever I've opened a map in a city like, I've never been to Topeka, but I've been to Ottawa once. I, I went to give a talk there. I opened a map uh, just after walking out of the hotel, and five or six people immediately came up to me and offered to help me find what I was looking for. You know, that would never happen in New York on Fifth Avenue anyway. People would walk right by. They wouldn't make eye contact. And the the student who posed that question said, well, look, uh, 
New York is the city on the planet with the highest hourly earnings, the richest menu of things to do of any city on the planet. If you stop and spend five minutes of your time talking with a stranger, you've given up something, something of greater value than just about anywhere else. In Topeka, maybe that's the most interesting option on offer for you at the moment, to meet the stranger and have a conversation. So it's just a, a, a difference in the opportunity cost of time was the suggested answer. And ma- and maybe it's not right. You know, I had a psychologist tell me, no, he didn't think that was it. He thought it was that if you're in a dense, uh, densely populated area, you need a certain amount of personal space, so you just reflexively adopt a, a, a more insulated posture when you're out on the street. But uh, And a doctor would tell you it's because you might get uh, germs from someone, and therefore, I mean, you know, it's interesting. We look at everything through our own lenses. Uh, right, right. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and exactly. economists tend to focus on costs and benefits. I, you know, I guess the quibble with it would be, uh, oh, come on, five minutes? You think, yeah, people, yeah. Yeah. what are you going to do? You're going to run into the Museum of Modern Art for five minutes instead <laughs> well, of Well, you're on person? your way there, and it's going to close. Exactly. And, and of course, it, it just changes your whole demeanor. It's not just that in that five minutes you make some rational calculation of whether it's worth it to talk to this person. It's, uh, it's more complicated than that. But my nine-year-old, I think it was my nine-year-old, had a, had a deep insight on this, though. His answer was, well, Topeka is simpler than, than New York, and if you, it's smaller, so you're more likely to know where the person's he- headed and the right way to yeah, get there, there you go. Uh, which I thought was yeah, a, I like a, a genius, uh, not economic, but, right. you know, it's interesting. Well, uh, sure, sure it's economics. <laughs> yeah, why should kind I of. stop if I don't have anything useful to tell this guy? Kind of, but I'm not sure it's really true. Manhattan's pretty straightforward, so I'm not sure that it's easier to master Manhattan, than it, uh, Topeka, than it is uh, right. Than Manhattan. Boston, for example, is smaller than Manhattan. Its layout is much worse in terms of giving directions. More people get lost there. I guess we'd have to test Boston versus a city of equal size. You know, the, you, you're talking about the response of kids to the book. Uh, this is somebody I don't know. His name is Lance Noble. He, he has a blog called DavosNewbies.com, but uh, he did a review of the book and he says in his review, I've been regaling my 11-year-old son with some of Frank's little economic puzzles at bedtime, and he can't get enough of them. So I think, there you go. Uh, you know, it really <laughs> does work with kids. You know, I've talked with kids, my own kids, growing up about this stuff, and, and they always had insightful things to say about them. And, and there's nothing in this book that a, a smart 12-year-old or 11-year-old, or well, your son's 9-year-old, couldn't really get his, his teeth in. Into. Yeah, I, th- I think that's, that's absolutely true. And I think uh, it's a good lesson for all types of learning. Uh, kids like puzzles. Right. Kids like right. challenges. Kids like if brain If the question's teasers. interesting, your, your reaction is, yeah, why is that? Yeah, you, you want to know. Now, one of the questions I really like from the book was uh, why, uh, why brides buy their dresses, but grooms rent their tuxes, which is a little bit weird because brides are only going to wear their dress once, we hope. That's the <laughs> ideal, at least. Uh, that's the plan. Whereas a groom is going to need a tux or going to want a tux uh, other times past a wedding. So why would you rent it? And the answer, give us the answer, which I think is absolutely yeah, right. This, uh, my student Jennifer Dulski posed that question. Yeah, and, and she also noted that the mystery deepens when we observe that uh, the bride spends often thousands of dollars on this wedding dress she'll never wear again. That's correct. While the groom rents a cheap suit, even though he's going to have scores of chances to wear a tuxedo in the future. The good questions have that nice uh, element in common. Uh, they just seem asked backwards. Yeah, it just seems like it ought to be the bride renting and the, and the, and the groom buying. So right. she had just gotten married, so it was an observation from her experience. And she started off by saying, well, look, on big occasions, it's more important for women to make a fashion statement than it is for men, which is a, obviously a big assumption to begin seems with. Seems to but, be true, though. But nobody seems to quibble about it. No. You know, nobody says, oh, well, that's not the way it is where I live. Everybody seems to sign off on the assumption. And if you'll start there, then it just has a nice, simple implication about the economics of the rental market. So if you want to make a fashion statement, uh, that means the rental company's got to offer you a very large selection of gowns for you, number one, to find a style that suits you, uh, and in each size, maybe they need 200 gowns. I don't know. You don't want to show up in a gown that a friend of yours wore to a wedding last month. So it's got to be a fairly large inventory. And because of that, the gowns rent out very infrequently, maybe every eight, nine, ten years. And so to carry such a large, idle inventory, they've got to charge 
110, 115% of the purchase price of the gown is the rental fee. And plus there are all the alterations that have to be done. The the gowns are typically form-fitting in the torso, much more so than men's suits are. So basically you you couldn't rent the gown for uh, any price except one higher than the purchase price. And in that case, the the well people buy. would never rent. But the guys, they're willing to show up in the same old style everyone else has always worn. They don't seem to feel bad about that. And so that means a rental company can serve a market with two or three suits in each size. And they rent out 8, 10, 12 times a year. A quarter of the purchase price is a nice uh, cost-covering rental rate they can charge. Yeah, I'm not, so, sure, I'm not sure it's the fashion statement as much as the desire to look uh, as beautiful as possible. And since women's bodies are less uniform than men's, you need more choices in shapes and styles, which, you is, which, as you point out, is also part of the alteration cost, which right. makes it much harder to have a, a, the rental unit. Um, it does dawn on me. I hadn't thought about this before, though. When you, when you make the claim that women care more about their, their gown than a man does about the, the, than the groom does about the tux, one piece of empirical evidence, which I, I hadn't realized is – and I don't – you can't – this is not collected by the – Census Bureau, but the number of times that a parent or uh, one of the people about to be married has burst into tears upon seeing, uh, say, the groom in his tux, I think is much lower <laughs> than with brides in their wedding gowns, uh, which is an interesting thing, uh, interesting puzzle, which we're not going to answer today, but I think it's I think it's true. Okay. Uh, and, and probably... Uh, so we'll file that away yeah. for, for processing. Um Another example, why are brown eggs more expensive than white ones? Now, the reason I like this one is it falls into a very large general category, which I think uh, one of the themes of the book is that once you start to see one, at least we hope, as we teach in the style, which again, I'm a big fan of, once you see this puzzle explained by this economic principle, then when you see the puzzle in a different form somewhere else, you'll recognize the template, and ideally you'll be able to apply the, the, the logic. So why are brown eggs more expensive than white ones? Okay, so uh, the question's interesting, first of all, because there's uh, credible evidence that they taste the same and have identical nutritional content. So why should they cost a different amount? That's, that's, that's what makes the question interesting to my eye. And the... There, it's in the chapter on supply and demand, this question. And you really need to call out the influence on the cost side and the benefit side, the, the supply side and the demand side, if you're going to square an explanation with this observation. So uh, what my students suggested who posed that question was that people seem to like brown eggs, many of them. They, they associate them with organic or healthful uh, uh, foods, brown rice is more healthful than white rice, and so on. Jonathan Chang was the student's name who posed it, uh, and he said, so uh, some people are willing to pay more for them, uh, just as somebody would be willing to pay more for a hotel room with a view. They like the looks of it better. But that's not enough. Uh, if it were just the demand side difference, then the question uh, would ring out, well, why are they bothering to sell white eggs if people like brown eggs better? Why not sell only brown eggs? And then he dug a little deeper and discovered that the, the hens who lay white eggs, on average, are a little smaller than the hens who lay brown eggs. And they eat a little less per egg produced. Somehow they're more efficient. So the cost of making white eggs is actually a little lower. And if you didn't have both the demand side difference and the supply side difference, you couldn't have a stable outcome as we seem to have here. And this, this this example was a very frustrating one to me because the 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 one negative review the book got in the popular press was in the Washington Post, and the reviewer complained bitterly that Frank doesn't tell us whether it's supply or demand oh. that explains the difference oh. in the price of these eggs when oh. that was precisely the point of the example. Painful. Uh, yeah, it's the Alfred Marshall. Both blades of the scissors. Yeah, both Man, blades yeah. of the scissors. You need them both, folks. Yeah, no, well, I like it because I use uh, a similar example, which I'm not going to give the answer to and let, let our listeners chew on, which is uh, why are red peppers more expensive than green ones? Uh, 
And a related one, which I will give the answer to, is why is single malt scotch more expensive than, than say, blend, not blended, but yeah, let me say it differently. Why is older wine more expensive than younger wine? Why are older bottles more expensive? Mm-hmm. And the standard answer people give is always the demand side. They always say, well, people like older wine better, and so people will pay more. So yes, people will pay more, but why do they have to pay more? Why doesn't competition among suppliers drive the price down? Da- uh, down and there has to be a cost difference in a, in a competitive market and the cost difference in the case of, of wine and aged scotch and many things is that it takes longer to make it you tie up your money in there and the opportunity cost of, of foregoing the money by selling the wine earlier has to be compensated otherwise you wouldn't be willing to sure the cost. yeah it costs money not to sell your wine right away but to wait so that phenomenon of both the cost side working with the demand side explains right. a, a lot. Well, of in the demands. case of wine too, the the wines that are worth keeping for many years tend to be the the big vintages, the ones that are unusually high quality and heavily extracted, and so they really do need time to develop. And so, even if they were sold at the same age as a regular wine, the the demand side willingness wouldn't, to pay yeah, wouldn't work would there. be higher. Now. But, oh. But yeah, that's that's a that's a nice example. Now I want to I want to challenge one of the arguments you give, and there's a theme in the in the book that I'm uh, less convinced of than than you are, and I'd like okay. to hear your thoughts on it. Sure. We talk about overtime. So it turns out in America, if you work uh, overtime, you have to be paid time and a half. Right. And you go, yay, that's great, time and a half, wonderful. But if you want to take less than that, because your employer might not be willing to pay and have you work overtime, you're not legally allowed to. So that transaction is banned by law. And give me the answer you give, and then I want to challenge you on it. Well, I'm, I'm saying your answer, it's but. an interesting question. Uh, if, if the worker wants to work 50 hours and the employer's willing to offer work for, for 50 hours a week at the regular wage, but the employer wouldn't be willing to pay time and a half, then it, it sounds on its face like you're making – the worker and the employer worse off by preventing them from engaging in that voluntary transaction. You know, that's why the question's interesting. The workers don't seem angry about the fact uh, that they get time, time and a half. Maybe you could say that's just because they don't realize that means they don't get to work as many hours as they want to. Uh, that's possible. But what I try to do in, in response to that question in the book is adapt Tom Schelling's hockey helmet explanation as as uh, a hypothesis to answer it, and uh, you'll call Schelling said, hockey players, if they're left to their own devices, always skate without helmets. Uh, yet, when they are given an opportunity, they vote unanimously for rules requiring them to. And so, uh, his explanation is that there's some competitive advantage you get by taking your helmet off. Uh, you can see better, you can hear better, you're less likely to be intimidated by others. They think you're nuts if you're skating without a helmet, uh, so they, they steer clear of you. Yeah. And so everybody sees that temptation to gain the advantage, so they take their helmets off, others match, and then everybody's skating without a helmet. You've got still half the teams win and half the teams lose, the same as if everybody had been wearing a helmet. So you're risking your safety for no ultimate gain. It's essentially a prisoner's dilemma, and so we do better by having a, a rule that requires it. So you can just push that same argument over in the, into the domain of safety regulation. So I might be tempted to take a riskier job to get higher pay fully voluntarily. Then I could take the money and bid for a house in a better school district. Uh, so could you. We would all do that. And then in the end, we would bid up the prices of houses in the better school districts to no avail. And it's the same argument extended onto hours. So you'd work longer hours to get ahead. I'd I'd work longer hours to level the the playing field, and then we'd each end up working long hours. And still, the the relative distribution of purchasing power, which is what counts so much in so many domains, would be left unaffected by that. So I want to dispute that and, okay. and, and get your uh, get your counterpoint. So in some examples, that is true that there's relatively bad choice of words. There, there's very little extra produced by this competition. Uh, and you give a number of – there's a bunch of examples in the book. They, they fall in the chapter where you're talking about the tragedy of the commons, mm-hmm. and they fall under a more general heading of uh, – I would call it you know where the invisible hand breaks down, right. where competition, which usually produces good results, uh, produces bad results. 
my claim is that in most situations, when competition produces bad results, it's because there are no property rights, for example, or we all agree that's often going to be a problem. Right. Trage- literal tragedies of exactly. the commons. So you don't have – no one owns the air. No one owns the ocean. So you get pollution and overfishing, uh, topics we talked about in, in the podcast with Don Boudreau recently. Um, so those are those are well understood. You occasionally get tragedies of the commons in artificial – Places where competition is, is zero sum is in hockey, where you've artificially limited the mm-hmm. entry in. So, for example, you could argue that steroid use, which is my favorite example of this, um, right. steroid use, ball players on their own are going to try to get an edge. So, they t- well, one player takes steroids, gets a big edge. If everybody takes steroids, nobody gets an edge, exactly. and all you've done is hampered your health. Right. The problem is that even in that case, uh, there's a there's a benefit that you, you want to at least acknowledge and take into account. Sometimes that benefit's quite large, and I want to, I'll want i come back and try to apply it in the overtime case. In the case of baseball, baseball fans really would much rather see uh, a 600-foot home run than a 325-foot home run. I'm, right. Let's be agnostic about whether steroids really help you hit home runs. I think it's an interesting oh, debate. I, I think the evidence seems pretty clear. It seems clear, but, but it, uh, there's an interesting paper by uh, Arthur Devaney where he actually suggests that he makes the claim that it, there's no there's no real evidence, and it's a pretty good paper. It's an inter- I'm not going to say it's quote right, but you could argue that just Barry Bonds and, and Mark McGuire and, and Sammy, Sammy Sosa, Sosa just, they're 16. just outliers. They're just outliers. They're going to have outliers all the in every time. You don't want to be fooled by <laughs> randomness. And right. the only problem I have with that is is uh, Brady Anderson hitting 50. So I agree that there there uh-huh. there are steroids seem to help, um, but. Let, let's put that. Let, let's accept that, whether it's true or not. It, it, we also assume that they're bad for your health, which we don't. I, I don't know if that's scientifically proven or not. But let's. Oh, I think it there's is. some pretty good evidence that okay. they are. Um, so the the claim would be that you know in this case everybody looks for an edge, fails to get one, uh, and it just endangers their health. But you do have to take into account that that the game is more is more exhilarating in a certain dimension, just like. You look at 1950s basketball players, they're all scrawny. None of them lifted weights. They didn't use steroids. Today's basketball players, I suspect some of them are using steroids. They're all lifting weights. The game's more entertaining, even though the balance, competitive balance hasn't changed. But that, that's even in the competitive zero-sum world of sports. When we move into the overtime case, and this is, I think, where it's more contentious, in that case, it's true that we'll all bid up the price of of housing, but there's lots of things we're not going to bid up the price of. We're just going to enjoy more stuff. So I work the extra hours. You work the extra hours. We get more um, purchasing power. We have more things that we enjoy, and the world's a better place. And maybe those laws against overtime, just like lots of other laws that limit competition, aren't there for socially beneficial reasons, but to prevent one group from having to work too hard. Uh, of of course, all that's all that's. Correct. If if the overtime laws said you could only work an hour a week, then I think there would be no question at all. But that the law is preventing people from putting out a little bit of effort, which wouldn't be too onerous, and getting a lot more stuff that would be of great benefit, no matter what anybody else had. I totally agree with that. In the in the baseball case with the steroids, I think yes, you do need to count the fact that the fans like the home runs. That's part of the package, too. If you're doing a cost-benefit analysis, you can't overlook that. But I think there, just as a practical matter, you would want to ask, is there some cheaper way to get long home runs than by having people pump their bodies full of stuff that's going to cause serious health problems in the future? I think it's probably a cheaper way to get that result if you just wind the ball a little bit more tightly. Yeah. Or we you should know, allow... We we should allow, runs going as far as we want. We should allow people with the ball. Yeah, you know, we should allow people to cork their bats. Yeah, yeah. so Good so point. yeah, that wouldn't be a compelling <laughs> reason for relaxing steroid bans. In the case of of the the hours, it's true. We we value the absolute stuff we have, uh, and in some domains, it's relative uh, quantities that seem to matter. If you if you go back to the you know, were track fans really happier when people ran the mile in four minutes and ten seconds rather than three three minutes and forty seconds? Uh, you you seem to suggest that track fans were were really bored and unattentive in those days, uh, and they're really enjoying it now because the absolute times have fallen so much. Uh, I'm skeptical of that. You know, it was really exciting when 
was it Roger Bannister who yeah. ran the first sub four minute mile? Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole world sat up and took notice. It was really exciting. Uh, and I remember having a car that I've, in the in the nineteen early nineteen sixties that seemed to me excitingly fast. I bet it wouldn't have accelerated to sixty miles an hour in under eleven seconds. Sure. But in the context of that time, it was a thrill to me. So there's no question but that context does shape evaluation in lots of different spheres. Where you get a distortion is when context matters more in some domains than in others. And I think what the evidence suggests directly is that if you look at how how much your house costs, uh, once your house has gone beyond a certain size, the main thing that predicts whether you'll be pleased with it is its relative size. If, if you give people a chance to move to a new world where they'd have half as much leisure as before, but much more than everyone else, nobody wants to make that move. You know, it's, it's context doesn't matter that much for leisure. But if you give a chance to somebody to move to a world where his house will be smaller than now, but in a neighborhood that's relatively advantage compared to other neighborhoods, then the, somehow the idea that, well, my kids will be going to the best schools or, or you know, that'll be a safe neighborhood or, or other parents will want their kids to play with my kids if I go there, but not if I go here. So it, it's, it's a distortion that re- you really only get if context matters more in some domains than others. Explain, and, and that's an empirical question. Yeah, explain that again. And, and why don't you broaden it to talk about the general issue of of relative versus absolute, because I, you, you've written a lot on that. It, this, it's not, it, you touch on it in this book. It's not the focus of this book right. in any way. But uh, again, I'm a skeptic on that. So make the case for why uh, competition, key question, there's lots of competition in life. Relative competition is much more prone to these tragedies of the commons than absolute competition. But I suspect our listeners don't know what I'm talking about, so why don't you put it if, into words? If your reward depends importantly on your rank relative to other people who are seeking the same reward. So, you know, Monica Sellis was stabbed in 1993 by a deranged tennis fan at a tournament in Hamburg, Germany. Steffi Graf earned twice as much in the next year as she did, had in the year before, not because she was playing better, but because relative to the competition, she was playing better. And that was only because Monica Sellis was out off the tour because so, of her injury. So in certain areas, this there's a famous you know work by Sherwin Rosen and Ed Lazier worked on this in the academic literature, right. on the economics of superstars. Uh, in certain places, we we want to hear the best. As you point out, when it was Roger Bannister at 359 or whatever it was, we got just as excited when the best was somebody who could do it in 348, run a mile in that speed. Um, we want to hear the best opera singer. We want to hear uh, – we want to watch the, the best golfer. Right. Uh, but I would argue that absolute – again, absolute ability does matter in those areas. It does matter. Yeah, I agree. But I want to – I want you to take it outside of sports where it's, where it's I think, a more plausible case to everyday life and, and the work environment, because I think that's where it's more interesting and more controversial, especially with the policy implications. Talk about well, that. Here, I think the simplest context to see the, the general underlying theory is the military arms race. So why is a military arms race problematic? Uh, everyone seems to think it is, if the contestants are equally matched anyway. I mean, maybe if you can spend your opponent into bankruptcy, a military arms race is just the thing. But if you were equally matched, then I think there's fairly general agreement that if you could verify and inspect and enforce that each side would do better to sign an agreement limiting spending on armaments rather than spend full out without Again, restriction. an area where competition would be destructive rather than productive. Okay, so, that, right. so what is it that produces that result? So when if you build more bombs, that means you build fewer toasters. I'm going to use toasters as a, sure. a metaphor for other consumption goods, so hospitals, schools, everything else besides bombs. If 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 your relative position in the toasters distribution were just as important to you as your relative distribution 
point position in the armaments distribution, then there'd be no problem. You'd you'd build more arms to try to get ahead of the rival nation, but then you'd, as a consequence of that, fall behind in the toaster distribution, and you'd have to start switching back to to build up your position there again, if it were equally costly to you to fall behind there. The only reason we say it's a problem that there's a military arms race is that falling behind in the toaster distribution is just less significant than falling behind in the armaments distribution. So if you want to go to the workplace, uh, so 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 the nations in in perfect uh, with perfect information sign agreements that limit their ability to compete in that arena, and nobody says, well, we've robbed them of their freedom to choose as they please. That was precisely what they wanted to do. Okay. So now, if you go to the workplace arena, the question is, uh, you've got two things you can do with your mo- with your time. You can use your time to earn more money or you can use your time to spend with your family and friends. You've already worked your 40-hour week. If you want to focus on the overtime example, that's where I'd go. So if I if I work the extra 10 hours, I'm going to be able to spend more on a house, and I'm going to have less time with family and friends. Not just more on a house. I'm okay. More uh, on, let's right. let's uh, get away from that issue. Let's, a TV, a yeah. car. Right. Yeah, so... If you think that the things I'll be able to buy generally are more, that my evaluations of them are more sensitive to context than my evaluations of leisure, then there will be the same kind of distortion that you see in the military arms race. Why? The military arms race is funded by the less context-sensitive good. We take money out of the toaster category and put it in the armaments category. Right, because, but you and, I, you and I are competing as economists, right? Right. And with all our thousands of other colleagues, and because of all of our effort, we're all acquiring more stuff. We're more, we're, we make more money than we did 25, 30, 40, 50 years ago as right. economists. Uh, and we might be working harder. Let, I'm not so sure about that, but let, let's say we are, and that's the response. We've got an upward sloping supply curve. Um, why is – where's the relative aspect of this? In the case of the arms race – uh, no one gets ahead because, as a result of the arms race, you just you're it's a zero sum game. You, you have more arms, but if your opponent has more arms, and what determines right. success is the relative amount of arms, you didn't get it really get ahead. But aren't we all getting ahead of where we were twenty five, thirty, and forty, and a hundred and two hundred years ago? We so, have more absolute stuff, yes. Okay, so why is that bad? That so called arms be, race. Be, you know, that and that was one of the things we looked at in trying to decide whether it was worth it to work the extra hours. Sure. It was that we valued the absolute stuff, but unless you say we didn't value the relative position in the distributions of of those things, then that was another motive, and it's that second motive that's zero sum. So, all motives don't have to be zero sum; just some of them do. So it's a question of the magnitude of them? Yeah, it's, it's really, it's in the end, an empirical question. And do we have any evidence on the magnitudes of those different... Well, if you, if you ask somebody, uh, where would you rather work? The, the, the two worlds are identical in every respect except one. If you go to the first world, you have a two in a hundred thousand probability of dying on the job if you and everyone else has a one in a hundred thousand probability of dying on the job so you got you got an unsafe job relatively speaking you could choose a different world where you'd have a four in a hundred thousand probability of dying on the job everyone else has six in a hundred thousand so it's absolutely a much riskier job but it's a relatively safe job which would you pick everybody i've ever seen confront that question says, I'll go where it's only 200,000 rather than move to where it's 400,000. It's not that you wouldn't notice you had the riskiest job in the first environment. You'd notice that. Maybe you'd feel bad about it, but you're not going to take twice the risk of dying in order to say, well, I've got a relatively safe job. Right. So that's a domain where absolute amounts seem really important. No doubt Relative about amounts it. don't seem that important. Rel- Again, this is all relatively speaking. If you ask the same question about cars, about interview suits, where would I rather be? Where I had a, a, a $2,000 interview suit, everyone else had a $6,000 interview suit, or a place where I had a, a, a $1,000 interview suit, everyone else had a $500 interview suit. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to pick that second world because I've got a better chance of getting the call back in that world. Well, yeah, that's true. Of course, you'd want to worry about 
the secondary ramifications of this. I and mean, one my, part of my skepticism about the emphasis on relative returns is that some of the return, some of the advantages of absolute returns are not so obvious in this kind of setting where you're asking a survey questions. So, for example, sure, yeah, I mean, this is, look, this is all. Uh, the the theory is very simple and clear. It's the military arms race theory. Toasters matter less in terms of relative holdings than than armaments do, and if if there's a difference across domains, then you get an arms race that sucks resources out of the the less context sensitive category and and loads them onto the more context sensitive category to ill effect compared to if you'd shift some resources back the other way then the, then it's from that point on the logic's clear it's all empirical you know are there are there categories that seem to mimic the those in the military arms race example are they important or are, are the magnitudes big you know is there anything we could do about it? you know those are all strictly empirical questions yeah i'm just reacting to the happiness literature which argues often that you know, we're, we're no happier than we were 50 years ago or 100 years ago, so we'd be better off living a simpler lifestyle, having a cleaner environment. Oh, I've, I've argued against that claim. I mean, you know, if somebody could actually experience what it would be like to have three of your five kids die before the age of 10, they wouldn't want to go yeah, that's my... move back to that environment. No, yeah. I think absolute income matters enormously. I, I totally accept that. Uh, but also, in some domains... Your relative holdings are important, and they're more important than, than in other domains. And, and I'll accept the fact that we haven't paid much attention to that in economics. I think it's an interesting area. And as you point out, I think it's an area where empirical work is, would be useful. Right. Uh, we don't know as much about it as we, as we should. Um, let's shift gears. Okay. I, I want to ask you one more uh, economic naturalist question, one of my own. It's related to one you ask in the book, and then I want to close with a, with a final example from the book. The question I want to pose is you raise in the is one you raise in the book, but, but a variant on it. You ask about why there's so much formalism in economics, and why there's so much mathematics. And I think the answer, if I remember it correctly, is that uh, you can appear more scientific if you start couching your arguments in fancy words and in jargon and equations. And there's again a sort of an arms race argument. But one different way to ask the question is is to ask the question the way you open the book, which is sort of this depressing situation where people spend millions of dollars on education and get mediocre results. Uh, now, one answer, of course, is just signaling. People don't really learn anything in college. Right. They're just showing that they can uh, work hard. I, I don't find that compelling for a I bunch of either. reasons. Uh, what I'm more interested in is why are the incentives of the modern university such that mediocre teachers who teach out of those voluminous exhaustive, dull books that only teach students how to take exams. Why do they continue to do that year after year? Why are the incentives the way they are? I have my thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, the, the, the first exposure I got to this general problem was in language uh, classes. I'd had four years of Spanish. I'd taken a couple years in German uh, in college. Uh, I went to Spain. I went to Germany. I had a very hard time making myself understood. Uh, you know, we were learning the pluperfect subjunctive. We were learning all this grammar that the professors thought important, but we weren't really learning how to function in the language. Maybe that wasn't the point, but... If, but it should have been. It should have been <laughs> the point, be because the if point. you could learn how to function, then you'd want to read... You'd yeah. want to read in that language. You'd want Travel. to talk to people in that language, and oh. you'd get better <laughs> at grammar and all those other things that yeah. that they were concerned about. Just just on the fly, you know. I I, I uh, learned so much grammar just reading in French. I never I never learned any rules, but I, I figure I have absorbed all of the stuff that they would have tried to teach me just by following the simple method that the Peace Corps teachers used to follow in my training program when I was getting ready to go to Nepal, which was uh, just keep it simple, repeat often, drill. You know, you had to be able to do do it nearly right before they'd try to move on, and then you'd, they'd throw stuff at you on the fly, and you had to respond on the fly. It had to be all completely under your control at every moment. And, you know, uh, there was a metric when the, if you have a Peace Corps volunteer who's supposed to go over to the country and start teaching math and science in the poly after 13 weeks and he can't function when he's standing in front of the classroom, you get feedback, you know, hey, these guys aren't, aren't performing their jobs. 
if we send economic students out into the world who didn't learn principles, well, nobody else knows principles either out there, so there's really no feedback yes, that's in that one, loop. That's one reason. That's absolutely right. They don't. The, the customer doesn't really realize how bad the job we're yeah, doing. Yeah, so I think if, if there it. were the kind of vivid feedback, so it was the foreign service language instructing programs that really introduced these reforms, these, you know, the, the idea that you can learn a language best if you exploit the brain's natural structure for, for learning language, to mimic the, the way a little kid learns language. Uh, and so they got feedback that the people weren't learning it from the traditional courses, and so they, you know, since the outcome really mattered to them, they changed it. But I don't think there's anything comparable to that in, in the economics world. You know, you send somebody out who didn't get the basic principles, who's going to complain? So that's one reason. I think the other reason is the incentives we face as as economists, as academics, as professors. Uh, and I think it has to do with, as you point out in the book, in a different context, the source of the money. Tuition only covers a small portion of total costs. The rest comes from endowment and research grants, government grants, foundation grants. And so the incentives for the professors to cater to the customer, there's more than one customer. And um, it's not a very... It's a it's fun it's a funny kind of competition that goes on in the academic world, um, because of that reward structure, right. because of that payment structure. There's, the customer doesn't get served the way the customer gets served. I think in other industries. So I think that's a huge part of it. Yep. And um, I, I salute what you and I hope I'm doing, and and my colleagues uh, here at least at George Mason, and I hope yours at Cornell are doing to. Uh, in spite of the incentives to... Uh, you know, uh, are you recording. confident, Russ, that if we tell an assistant professor that he ought to teach a course the way we're recommending, that that would be a good career move? I do, actually. I, I worry a little bit about it because, you know, I think uh, I've heard people say, oh, he, that he doesn't teach a rigorous course. Oh, or the students won't be prepared for the intermediate course. Well, uh, the, the problem with that second argument is is that, which which I think is an argument that people use often to, to justify crummy teaching. They say, well, I have to teach marginal productivity theory and average and marginal and fixed costs theory because they won't be ready for the later courses. It's true it's dull and it doesn't have any application, but at least they need it for that later course. What happens when they take the later course is the teacher, as you point out, faces the fact that students have forgotten all of that material and they review it anyway. Right Now, there's a benefit from having seen it before, but in general, I think the argument that that the theory builds on that the previous theories is is over overrated. Well, and never mind the fact that so many students who probably would enjoy what we do if if they gave it a chance have no interest at all in taking the intermediate course because they didn't like the principal yeah, course because it was dull. Uh, but we never see them again. Here's the argument for why I think it's a good career strategy for all you assistant professors out there who who are who care about um, who have a passion independent of rewards of the monetary rewards, have a uh, non-monetary reward uh, passion for teaching well and for conveying the economic way of thinking. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make a confession here. I'm, I'm not going to list the institutions I've taught at, but you can find out if you look around. <laughs> I'm just going to, I've taught at a, a number of them. They're, many of them are very, very respected universities. They're in the top 25 of, in, any, in most polls. And George Mason, I'm proud and ashamed to say, is one of the only places, maybe the only place, where good teaching was honored and um, and rewarded. And and the worst, the, the real problem is, is that, I've, and this is where I won't name the institution, I've been at institutions where good teaching was sneered at by my colleagues as a, somebody who was a sucker who wasted time. Right. And uh, I found that deeply appalling and depressing. But... Uh, most of the many of the places I've taught at, the chairman didn't care whether you taught well or not. So if you're at one of those places out there, I'm fortunate not to be at one of those places, and I and I hope that's true you too, Bob. But if you're at one of those places, which I'm ashamed to say some of you out there are, since they don't care, you may as well do a good job. Now the reason I think people don't do a good job in that setting is that it's costly to do a good job, have extra office hours, etc. Right. The beauty of this way of teaching is, you know, it's not so hard. It's just chatty if you do it well. You don't have to work up your notes. Now, the problem is, is if you teach the dry way, you work up your notes, you use them over and over again, year in, you're out the same dull graphs and the mm -hmm. same dull equations. So that's true. You'll lose that advantage. But you'll have the reward of your, of your students actually liking your course. What a novel concept. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So uh, to close, I want to I let you close with, um, now that I've gotten onto, I'll step down off my soapbox. Um, <laughs> 
I want to let you close with um, a wonderful example at the end of the book on the economics of commitment and marriage. And you start off with the beautiful example of a landlord and a, and a tenant, which is a way to soften us up. So soften us up with that, if you can, and talk about the economics of, of marriage. Yeah, uh, the, the relationship market, it's been called, really is a market in many ways. People do look for mates uh, very carefully, uh, much as they might shop for apartments. Uh, and, and there are a lot of interesting similarities between the two cases. Uh, the, the one I focus on in, in the example I discuss is that uh, time short and search is very costly. If you're looking for an apartment, you can't look, for every, look at every conceivably available unit in a large metropolis. You just don't have time. What you do is you go out and you sample a bunch of them. You take trips and visit, visit, walk through a bunch, and you look at the rent and the various qualities and locations, and you decide what's what's the range of stuff on offer, and then you make up uh, your mind that once you find one that meets a certain threshold on each of those dimensions, you're just going to rent it. And then once you do that, typically the next step is you sign a lease. Well, why the lease? Because... There's bound to be some apartment out there that's better than the one you just found. Uh, you know, you just didn't have a, ch a chance to look at them all. It wasn't worth your time. If you stumble upon it and you didn't have a lease, well, then you'd want to just drop the one you're in and move on to the next one. That would leave your landlord out in the cold. He spent a lot of money showing the apartment and chose you because he thought you'd be a good tenant. Now he's got to start all over again. And it's the same on his side. You know, if he if he's looking for a good tenant, he's not going to want to interview every conceivable tenant. He's he's going to choose one that seems good enough. Finally, and that was you. Uh, now, if you don't have a lease, you you move in, you hang your art, you you buy rugs to fit, you you install cable and phone and all that. Then a better tenant comes along, and he says, "Well, he gives you a month's notice to get out." Uh, that's a worse outcome for both parties than if there'd been a lease that committed them to forego the better option. Well, you can imagine the analogy to the search for a partner. You know, there's always a faster gun out there somewhere, somebody who's smarter and better looking, better looking and or earns more money and is kinder and uh, has all the social skills that, that you lack. Uh, if that person comes along and if it's just uh, a free agent market at every stage, then there's no commitment. Uh, you don't dare have children or buy a house together because the moment somebody better comes along, you'll be out in the cold. And so I think that's the one chink in the narrow cost-benefit model of the economist model of the relationship market. It's it's typically a, a very ruthless, marry the best person will have you market, and every, every trait trades off against every other trait. Uh, what seems to happen in real life is that maybe that's how people search. They go, they go where people that meet their objective criteria are likely to, to be available. But once, once they get into a relationship, it really becomes much more that person that is what you care about, not, not the person's specific characteristics. So yes, there's a faster gun, but that's, you know, this is my person here. I don't, I don't care that a faster gun came along. If, if you didn't have that security that the person cared about you because you're you, then uh, I think it would be awfully hard for people to go forward in relationships. A marriage contract gives you some commitment, but, it, you know, it's not like property where a lease may be all you need. Here you need something more than that. And we have, as a result, love, which is um, there, <laughs> The economic awesome. naturalist's explanation of love. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful thing. I think it's, um, I think it's lovely. My guest today has been Robert Frank, the Henrietta Johnson Lewis Professor of Management at the Johnson School at Cornell University. His latest book is The Economic Naturalist, In Search of Explanations for Everyday Enigmas. Bob, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Okay, Russ, really good to talk to you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.